Hey, it's Empire's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. The writer Stephanie Land's breakout book, Made, was a memoir about her life as a single mother, living in poverty, working as a maid. It got all these accolades and was eventually turned into a Netflix miniseries. Her follow-up book, Class, is her story after that period in her life of going to college and becoming a writer. And early on in this interview, NPR's Aisha Roscoe asks why. Why go to college to be a writer, of all things, while still juggling parenthood and bills and everything else life was throwing at her? And she says something kind of simple but enlightening. She says that if she didn't at least try, she wouldn't be happy. That interview's coming up after the break. This message comes from Apple. Apple Gift Card is a practical gift that unlocks a world of entertainment and fun. You can send it via email or give a physical card to your loved ones, friends, or family. They can use Apple Gift Card to buy Apple products, accessories, apps, and games. But they can also use the funds to pay for music, movies, TV shows, and more. Visit Apple.com for details and to send Apple Gift Cards to your friends and family this holiday season. Author Stephanie Land has called poverty an invisible and isolating experience. In her first book, Made, we followed her journey as a poor single mother who cleans rich people's homes to make ends meet. And in her second, called Class, she adds a new challenge, going to college to fulfill her dream of becoming a writer. Stephanie Land joins us now from Missoula, Montana. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Your first book, Made, was a breakout success. It was adapted for Netflix and was on Obama's summer reading list for 2019, which is a huge deal. What inspired you to write a sequel? The part of my story that I really think is the most important, I guess, was that I got out of a bad situation and got myself to an environment and a community that was supportive and went on to graduate from college with a degree that I had originally set out to do. I had a lot of people trying to convince me to basically get a job that would put me in an administrative assistant type of position um, to have that sort of job security and I decided to go for it and and to try, at least try, to be a writer. You talk about this so much in the book. You know, you're a single mother. And so to make the decision to go to college to be a writer, which can be very up and down, um, like, what do you think it is about yourself that made you have the faith to go for this dream when you're really just, you know, making ends meet and struggling to do that? Um. For me, being a writer was something that I've wanted since I was 10 years old. And I knew that I needed to at least try. I knew that if I didn't do that, then I wouldn't be very happy (laughs) going forward with my life. Reading your story and it, like, I mean, I think about all the women in my family who whether the man was there or not, uh, were taking care of business. Like a great aunt that had to raise 10 kids by herself. My grandmother cleaned houses. Um, And so I'm, I'm thinking of all these women. They're living in poverty. They're also Black. And they don't get the chance to tell their stories. And they don't get the book deal or the Netflix deal. What do you think of of those women who don't get to tell their stories, but are living this every day? Um, I I recognized pretty early on that people were paying attention to my story because it was a very palatable type of poor person story. I'm I'm a, a white person who graduated college. I'm a quote unquote success now. Like I'm the rags to riches story that a lot of people like to listen to. And I had a conversation with a a photographer, actually, who was a black man, and we were talking about this. And I I said, you know, they're they're listening to me because I'm I'm white. They should be listening to people of color, not me. And and he said, but they are listening to you. And if they listen to you, then they might listen to other people. And I try to keep this hope within me, kind of, that um, 
that the more personal stories are shared, then perhaps more empathy will grow, and that might turn into compassion. When you were writing this story about yourself or like going back through it, were there things that surprised you when you look back on it? I I think I was surprised at how angry I felt for myself and for the time period and and what I had to go through um, for how lonely I was, for how much shame I felt. I am almost 10 years out from my graduation from college. So it's been a while and I have, you know, of course had more success and I'm, I'm in a much more privileged situation now. And I have a different sense of normalcy to go back and write through these scenes where I was just struggling to get through the day. It made me mad. And I I wasn't really allowed to feel mad. I wasn't really allowed to feel anything um, when I was in it. I didn't have time. Mm. I mean, another part of that that you delve into, which I mean, I think is, is such a big part of poverty, is this idea that people feel like if you're poor, you don't deserve to have anything. Well, it's poor people can't have nice things. And I have heard that over and over I mean, when I first started writing about being on food stamps, I was I was still on food stamps. And I looked at the comment sections and almost everything that people got upset about was that I was a poor person and therefore I should not have a nice thing. When I wrote Made, I purposely left in a couple of things that I knew people would get mad about. One was this scene where I'm like fighting to get organic milk from a wick check. And another is I bought myself a $200 diamond ring. It was almost comical, like how people would get upset about that. So in this book, I just kind of went for it and, and threw everything in there. Like I'm going out, I'm behaving like a college student at some points in the book. And one lady on Goodreads is upset that I was buying my daughter ice cream so much. And I have grown to kind of enjoy doing that (laughs) because it says so much more about the person who is actually upset than it does about me. That's Stephanie Lan. Her new book class is out this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, before we wrap up, the end of the year is coming up, and we're reflecting a bit here at Book of the Day, and we're also looking ahead to everything we'll dig into in 2024, hopefully with your financial support. This is where we want to say a big thank you to our new Book of the Day Plus supporters and anyone listening who already donates to public media. Your support ensures that everyone has free access to reliable news and podcasts, including those who can't afford to give this season. And to anyone out there who isn't a supporter yet, right now is the time to get behind the NPR network, especially with our journalists gearing up for an important election year. So join NPR Plus or make a tax-deductible donation now at donate.npr.org slash books. Thanks! With Barbenheimer and both Taylor Swift and Beyonce on tour, it was a lot of cultural news to keep up on this year. Hollywood actors have gone on strike. The Prince's memoir, Spare, is out. I'm Andrew Limbong, an arts and culture reporter for NPR. Coverage that keeps you in the know is made possible from donations by people like you. Make your gift at npr.org slash donate. Support for this podcast and the following message come from South Carolina Federal Credit Union, a member-owned financial institution. South Carolina Federal is dedicated to serving your financial needs and investing in the South Carolina communities where you live and work. Visit scfederal.org. Support for this podcast and the following message come from South Carolina Federal Credit Union, a member-owned financial institution. South Carolina Federal is dedicated to serving your financial needs and investing in the South Carolina communities where you live and work. Visit scfederal.org.